It was astonishing to witness COVID-19's unbelievable impact as we observed pollution levels dropping and skies becoming bluer. Our mindsets appear to have shifted in a positive and a hopeful change with the change in the lifestyle and shift in the approach towards the nature. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to open the workshop on environmental activism and climate change. This is a student-led event, and we are very grateful to all the students who are participating at this event and who provided questions to our speakers in advance of this event. We all know that climate change is one of the most important and urgent environmental issues, and young people, especially students, are aware of the need to address climate change. We are very proud that UOB students are well involved in different climate initiatives and the levels of environmental activism. Environmental activism is very broad term and can entail different forms of activism. And we are very keen to demonstrate the breadth of different forms of activism from business initiatives, involvement in NGOs and advocating for the role of different areas of study in getting people involved in climate change issues. Now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Naomi, who is not only a PhD researcher at University of Birmingham, but also a senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University where she teaches about sustainable futures. Naomi has spearheaded sustainable campaign against fossil fuels for uh, exploitation, as well as legislative changes to ensure procedural and substantive rights at the UK level. She's currently organizing a project in her that uh, blends art and action to address the effects of climate change. She believes that communities are effectively our environmental defenders. Hence, you will see her advocating for communities as environmental defenders and enforcing their rights to the use of legislation. So Naomi, welcome on board and here's your chance to share your views with all of us. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I just wanted to say a few words and I thought I would talk a little bit about my experience because I, I think that might be um, helpful um, in terms of thinking about uh, what is actually going on in the UK. Um, but I also wanted to make some suggestions about what we might need to call for, um, because we have a, a bit of a parlous situation on environmental law in the UK, and I, I don't think we're heading in the right direction. So I think there's a, a real need for a really broad based and active call for some, some really, really big changes. And uh, the more we can all um, work together on that and share our thoughts, I think the, the more important that would be and the more effective um, we might actually uh, win something then. Um, so my experience um, in environmental activism has um, stemmed from my um, 16 years where I worked at Friends of the Earth and um, my role there was uh, supporting communities who were effectively uh, fighting dirty developments. And um, so the cases that I've been involved with involve landfill. So people had waste um, leaking into their homes because they were next to landfill sites that weren't properly being dealt with. Um, coal mines, the South Wales coal mines, uh, the one up in Druidge Bay. And of course, a Friends of the Earth has been involved in the most recent one in Whitehaven, uh, which is a really big undersea um, coal mine. Um, fracking. Um, so that was uh, six years of uh, trench warfare, objecting to every single application that came forward um, and helping communities to do that. Um, and air quality. So again, air quality is one of those issues that we face in many um, cities and places across um, the UK. Um, and it's communities who I think are, are bearing the brunt of that and also um, leading the charge. So why do I think that communities are effectively our environmental defenders? And it's really interesting to see how, um, when we are connected to our place and to the people that we live with, um, we are most able to see um, that environment. Uh, we connect with it emotionally and um, that passion helps us to stand up, I think, and defend that. That is my um, experience of working with communities and communities when also we everybody works together we band together we're incredibly powerful um, so um, my belief is that fracking in the UK was stopped because all of those communities um, stood up and said um, we don't want this development here and people will say well 
I'm not sure people understood what fracking was about or what it was. Um, and I actually don't think, you know, my experience doesn't, doesn't seem to bear that out. Um, when you're talking to a community, of course, the initial response might be, I don't want that oil rig in the field next door to my house or wherever it is. But once you start to discuss the issue, it immediately comes in, oh, that it's, it's a water pollution issue. Oh, it's gonna cause greenhouse gas emissions. But what about climate change? People are actually pretty disinterested. It may, may start with something that affects you directly, but it grows into a, a massive um, care for the world. And as part of actually my research for the PhD, one of the things that I found absolutely fascinating is that um, the government has um, all the power, but doesn't see, seem to feel any sense of responsibility towards the environment. The communities feel an immense sense of responsibility um, towards their environment, um, but don't have enough power. So there's that definite um, imbalance there. And I think the, the, the three laws or the three sort of sets of rights, let me talk about them as rights, because um, in law, the devil's always in the detail. Um, but the three kind of rights that people use most um, in defending their environment um, are the Aarhus or Aarhus Convention rights. So the right to information, uh, the right to participate and the right to challenge. And these are fundamental um, to any um, community activism. Um, and it's interesting on the right to information, for example, um, Friends of the Earth back in the 80s, that they pioneered something called Factory Watch, where you could put in your postcode and see what factories were near you and what they were emitting from the chimney. You know, in that simple access to information, understanding what is happening in your environment is incredibly powerful. Um, and also that access to information in every kind of planning application, which is why I'm always very interested in the land use planning system, because it's where we make the decisions. Um, you know, you, you need that information to be informed about the impacts of certain um, developments. And that moves me on to the right to participate. And I think we have very few rights to be involved in environmental decision making in the UK. Um, and one of the most powerful is that held in um, the land use planning system. And that is um, under the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act, where you have a right to be heard in person at a local plan examination. And nobody can take that away from you if you object at the right time. That doesn't, you know, everywhere else, you can do submissions, you can do consultation responses, but you don't have that right to be heard. So I think that's, that's really crucial. And that's where you can see a lot of legislation, a lot of environmental legislation, a lot of changes that are happening and we don't get a say in that decision. So, for example, um, this, there's a legal challenge that the organisation that I lead, um, we have just been in the Court of Appeal and we've been challenging the government's changes to permitted development rights. And this takes a million and a half buildings in England out of a, a development decision making system where you have a right to object and says now the, you know, the owners, the private owners have the right to develop and there is no right to object and there's no democratic decision. And that law was changed in six weeks through a statutory instrument. Um, so there's really, it's very undemocratic lawmaking going on. And I think it has a really big impact on, on our rights. And it's very, very difficult for people to track these. It's, you know, the, the details really matter. How long do you get to respond? Is it seven days? Is it zero? You know, is it, you know, is it set by somebody else? Um, you know, all of those things affect our ability to participate in environmental decision making. So, for example, the Environment Agency changing rules so that it issues standard permits. There is no consultation anymore. You get a permit to pollute on certain types. Um, those sorts of things are happening, I think, all over the place, particularly um, post um, withdrawal act um, we can see those sorts of things coming in in the environment bill where we're losing lots of rights here there and everywhere and that's really limiting our ability as communities to take up that role of environmental defenders and so the last thing I'd say is the other right that we have is the right to challenge obviously judicial review on public authorities a procedural right limited because you can't talk about the substantive issues um, so the, the permitted development rights challenge that we've just heard in the Court of Appeal was all about strategic environmental assessment. So 
um, we were arguing that she basically just changed the plan making system in England without actually considering the environmental impacts of that. Um, so it's an amendment or a revocation of, of that planning um, framework. Um, so I think we may still have to wait three weeks to see whether um, we <laughs> win on that point or not. But it's, you know, um, procedurally, it's very difficult. Obviously, we are looking at duties and whether um, authorities have acted um, lawfully. Um, for example, on uh, the Climate Change Act, um, we this summer um, in our organisation, we um, asked the government to tell us whether it had implemented Section 13 of the Climate Change Act, which is a duty that it has to um, consider whether policies and proposals are compatible with the carbon budget. Um, unfortunately, the government can do very little. It can just mention climate change, but nothing substantive, and it will have um, fulfilled that duty. So some of our um, legislative requirements aren't really strong enough for us to um, hold um, the government to account. So I think that I would just finish with saying that um, we need to defend and extend our rights. And I think that the two rights that we should be calling for um, to help us in our environmental activism are uh, third party rights of appeal. Um, and I don't know if I need to do just a little quick explanation. So when you um, a development is approved by a local authority, a developer Oh, no, sorry, when a development is refused by a local authority, a developer can appeal that refusal. But if a development is approved by a local authority, there is no right of appeal for a community which would balance out that system. So developers, businesses have more rights than communities effectively. So if communities had a third party right of appeal, we would be able to appeal a development on the basis of environmental impact. That is how you could structure that third party right of appeal. Um, and it's something that um, um, I've been <laughs> working on promoting for 20 years. So I think, you know, the time is now. Um, so still hoping that, you know, that is something that maybe um, we can we can win um, when we've got such kind of development pressure. And we are, you know, uh, less than 10 years away from 2030 when we are supposed to have achieved so many changes to get us to a um, or as much away as much as possible to a zero carbon economy. And the second thing I would call for is obviously the right to a healthy environment. And I think this is where things like the air quality case um, come in, where we, we are just not dealing with the fact that um, communities are suffering pollution and the causes and factors leading to that pollution are complex and lie in lots of decision-making processes. And actually to cut through all that, and to actually protect people's health, you would need to have a substantive right to a healthy environment um, where you could bring, bring that case on that basis. And so it wouldn't be procedural, but it would be um, substantive. And I think that is um, in the absence of a, of a constitution and in the absence of stronger environmental protections, I think there is um, an increasing case um, to be made for that. So, Questions. Thank you very much for that. I hope that was helpful and not too long. Sumarash, is it okay if I go first with questions? Because I've got a few questions from students in the um is, is that okay? Okay. So Naomi, thank you very much. And I think I, I, I completely agree with you. We're entering a really kind of dark phase for environmental or post-Brexit. Um, and there are various concerns that we need to think about. But one thing that you have mentioned, which I think is really important um, for students to note, because our students are really engaged um, when it comes to climate change and environmental issues. But I wonder whether the wider community is equally engaged. And I think one of the things that we see is that the, the, the community is only get engaged when, when it's a local issue. But what in your view, because you have such a vast experience um, in, in, in climate change activism and wider environmental activism, how do we get communities engaged when it's not just a local issue, but kind of bigger environmental issues? How we get that momentum? Because I think this is that we're missing. We have students always on board, but the, the, other, uh, the other sections of, of the population. Yes, so that is a really, it's a question that NGOs have been grappling with 
um, I think since um, Rio, is how to get everybody engaged in the response. So what I would say is the fascinating thing about the difference in between, say, dealing with fracking and dealing with sea level rise, both climate change issues, is fracking is right in front of you. And it's quite easy to get involved in climate change when the issue is present in front of you. But if it's sea level rise, you can't see it, you can't touch it. You know, it's, you've got to imagine this future. It's really difficult to engage with. So how do you how do you create that connection? And I, I, I think it's true that with with all communities, you always have to talk about how it affects you. Um, and I think we have to get away from, oh, but somebody else is doing something really bad, so I'm not going to do it because of the legacy of of the UK's impact on the environment is immense. So I mean, I'm, 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 I never accept the argument because I just say, well, look at the legacy, <laughs> you know, reparations, the UK needs to make reparations here. Um, but I, and I think that's so a project that I have um, and that I'm running at the moment in Hull, um, it's called the Shorelines Project. And the idea of that was to try and work out if you can make the issue present for people in the place where they live, would that engage more people? So the idea is, is that we draw the line. So Hull is facing 1.5 metres of sea level rise. Um, and that's pretty much guaranteed. That's what the Environment Agency figures are. They give you the figures, but don't put it on a map. So nobody knows what it actually means. They just have this number. And then of course, you've got to deal with topography and geography and all sorts of different things. And do you have defenses of not? So we thought, well, you put a line through the city and you go, right, okay, this is the line. This is your new shoreline. You step over that and one side is water and that's where it's kind of coming up to. You know, like this is, we have to imagine this future. And so, I'm trying to use art to get people to engage with a future that you can't yet see. And um, so that is, and that is something, so we've done lots of murals in Hull, we've got five, we're doing one for COP26 um, on the side of the Scottish Opera House. Um, and we're basically trying to kind of bring alive this issue of, of, of adaptation to rising sea levels as a kind of really visible thing. But I, I think the issue is one, it takes time, you always have to talk people through it. So you can't just, you know, I, I just don't think it doesn't work if you don't have this conversation. So for me, facing climate change is always about having the conversation. Once you've had the conversation, everybody will, will get involved. There is, you know, there's, you know, you're always going to get that engagement. Some people are always going to be disinterested, but enough people are really, are really engaged. Um, and I, I think enough people want and value their place enough that if you make it relevant to them and their place and their story, and the climate story is their story and not the story that you're trying to get them to step into, but you step into their story and bring climate in, then you generate more, um, more activism. I hope that answered your question, Alex. It just kind of went off. Yeah, no, 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 that, this is great because I think that this is the main problem. Exactly what you said, we can't really see what, what, is, what is out there for us and what will be our future. So, so thank you very much for that. I think uh, Zoe has another question there. Yeah, um, before I ask, but I, yeah, I completely agree. Um, often it, it, it's very, it's often harder to care about things that seem way off, but actually a lot of things like sea level rise will affect us. We just have to sometimes be forced to imagine it <laughs> um, or be shown it. Um, I have a question in the chat from Daniel Sylvester that says, is there currently any system or resource to allow the public to keep up to date with current and proposed laws in an understandable way provided by an independent body, i.e. not the government or media? No, but I think it would be an absolutely excellent project to do. Um, I don't know, Legal Watch, Environmental Law Watch, definitely think somebody should be doing it. We, oh, I was at a, a conference about the Aarhus Convention with um, the legal community in London. It was organized by Lee Day. And um, there was the, the amount of legal changes that are happening, particularly through SIs and statutory instruments. You know, nobody can, it has got a handle on how much is being changed. And it's a real problem because of the resource that's required to go through all that and to understand the implications for communities in particular. So um, it would be an amazing project if anyone's offering. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not very helpful. <laughs> No, I completely agree. It would be great. <laughs> One day, I'm sure there will be. 
No, we, we have another question, which is which is really interesting from Anna. Uh, she's essentially asking about the um, liability of companies. And we all know that, you know, um, having the corporate liability is a, is a big challenge in law. And the question is that how can companies be held accountable irrespective of what they have been permitted to do so as regards damage, disruption, pollution, and longer term health impacts. So this is a really interesting question because we, we do need to grapple with that. I absolutely agree. So, because um, my background is more um, planning law, um, there's two ways that we do that in planning law. One is obviously that you're doing it through um, planning authorities um, and other authorities like the Environment Agency doing enforcement. So if it's irrespective of what they've been permitted to do. So the, prob the, pr the problem really is, is if they've been consented or given that pollution permit or given that development consent that allows them to do things through their conditions, which then end up in pollution. Pretty difficult because you've then given them consent. However, um, you either have to challenge the consent. So, for example, one of my colleagues, um, one of the associates at Rights Community Action is working on the big um, offshore oil and gas exploration, the Guyana case. I don't know if everyone's heard about this. It's a huge, um, a huge development. Now, there's there's real problems with the environmental impact assessment there. So you know, there the challenge is around whether the company has followed the, the correct procedures. And I think um, that's, that's a really an important intervention that we need to make, because it all depends on whether you're intervening after the fact when the pollution has happened. So that's a kind of ecocide approach from ecocide law, where unfortunately you're looking at the damage and you want to stop it. So you're, you're trying to just stop the damage that's being caused fines, injunctions, that kind of thing, or you try and stop them getting permission in the first place. So most of our development activity is obviously um, done by companies. It's companies who are applying to do all of this stuff. So I would recommend that we work on stopping them getting consent because it changes, you know, then, then they're not actually going out there and doing the damage. I, would, I, I am very much for, let's just not give consent for these activities. How do we stop that? Yeah, definitely. Um, one last question, unless there are any quick questions from the chat still. Um, I was just wondering, so you talked a lot about legislation and that you believe there needs to be a lot of reform, basically, in the UK's environmental and climate legislation, um, especially for communities and the rights that they have. Do you think the changes are more need to be more in what legislation is actually in place or is it more so the aspects of legislation such such as the rights that communities do or don't have or whether they can appeal things etc so if you take the climate change act as an example when the climate change act was being um i was working at friends of the earth when that was being promoted through parliament so that was quite a long-running campaign but it was around two years and there were two bits of there were two bills that were going through together one was the climate change bill and one was the planning bill which is now the Planning Act 2008 and the Climate Change Act 2008. The interesting thing about the Climate Change Act is it's like a budgeting system. So you are basically, you're having to account and work out your budgets, but it does not connect necessarily to your decision-making system. The only place it connects is the place where we managed to get it into the Planning Act 2008 and we got in section 10, um, which basically put cli me mentioned climate change. I mean, you have that read across and that is why the Heathrow case was successful because it used the Planning Act provisions. It didn't use the Climate Change Act provisions. So that's the real issue is that, you know, there are, there are two kind of really big holes in our climate change legislation. One is there is no duty on decision makers on climate. You have a duty of the Secretary of State to report to um, Parliament on progress on climate. And you've got these duty to prepare the budgets and you've got the CCC as advisory committee. But you don't, all of the people who make decisions, there's many more than the nominal Secretary of State who's meant, you know, who, who embodies that kind of legal entity set up by the Climate Change Act, but all these other people making decisions and they don't have a specific climate duty. So you can't hold them to account on climate. Um, and you see, you don't have that, that, that responsibility as they're not being devolved and then you can't hold to account on that. So that's what makes it, you know, so then you then communities can't do their accountability job. 
it, you know, so that's why you then have to look at, okay, so you have to fix the accountability part and the responsibility part. And then you have to fix the bits where communities are not being involved in decisions and not being able to influence decisions, don't have enough time. So for example, you know, the Planning Act put in place a very, very fast track system for consenting major infrastructure projects. And basically none of those projects got refused. It's just too quick. I mean, I was in the M4 examination. We um, brought in, I brought in, I, I was questioning their evidence on climate. They said it would make a nominal difference to climate emissions over 10, 15 years. No, no sums were provided, no evidence given as to where the Highways England had got those figures from. The inquiry or the examination closed before that evidence came forward. And I just get a little note saying, well, we ran out of time and, and we've now proved it. So <laughs> it's like the, the process really matters when you want to make an intervention and you want to make information valuable. Um, so, so that's why you always have to look at, you know, that's why I'd say that you'd look at where, where are we making decisions? Where are the big decisions being made? And what opportunities are there for communities to be involved? in those decisions, because they're actually doing the accountability as they get involved in those decisions, NGOs and communities are doing that. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was a good answer. Um, we do have one more in the chat. Do we have time? Alex, go on, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, Anna says in the chat, um, water companies are allowed to pump out untreated effluent in extreme cases, but do it daily. So this would require a challenge to this consent. Yeah, and I think that's happening at the moment, isn't it? Because of uh, Thames Water. So I think there are cases ongoing at the moment. You know, my issue with that is that you are you're having to chase the fact that they've already polluted. You're gonna you're having to chase the polluters who are polluting. And trying you're trying to stop them doing it and i and i think it's really important that we we, we try and prevent them <laughs> from polluting so i totally agree we need much stronger enforcement and you know it's hugely disappointing that today the environment bill is back in the house of commons and the government has basically refused to take on board any of the changes made in the house of lords which were all there to try and strengthen the role of the um office for protection of the environment um, so you can you can see there that that's a really big issue it's not getting a lot of or huge amounts of public attention and it's a big problem for us because you know we need a really strong enforcement body one that stands you know aside from government and can actually just act for the environment i mean in when the localism not localism act um when the local economy devolution had a very long title bill uh, became an act in that it changed um, the duties of public authorities and gave them all an economic growth duty. Now this is in stark contrast to Wales, which basically gave all of its public authorities a, a future generations duty and said you have to think about future generations. So the whole concept of how we think about government and the role that they play is very different between England and, and Wales, and, and Scotland is obviously thinking about substantive um, environmental right, uh, right to a healthy environment. So there's a big divergence there. So I think, you know, the, the, the problem is with the politics at the moment in, in England is that it's, the environment is, is very much um, an afterthought. It's not at the core of thinking. And that's something where, you know, um, environmental law suffers when we don't have the um, political um, leadership on it. And if I can just add to that, sorry, I was kicked out of Zoom, so that's why I was silent for a, for a moment. I think the other issue that we have, um, and that's lack of proper enforcement. So sometimes we do have laws which are actually good, but there is really no compliance and then no subsequent enforcement. And I think that the case that Anna brought up is, is a typical example where enforcement is failing because there are uh, regulations in place but anyway i'll leave, leave it to summer now to to i think we had uh, uh, we'll stop the questions here and then con continue i know it was quite interesting to hear all your like viewpoints and opinion towards the law personally i'm from the law field as well so i all i can say is that it was a it laid your speech just laid a good foundation for a COP26 like first event. And I really want to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to like join us today and share your views with all of us. 
thank you so much for coming and now i'd like to ask kefa to like take the lead and continue our interview thank you very much for inviting me thank you thank you so much shromit um we're now moving into the next phase of our program and this will be the panel engagement and our speakers will come from uh, different disciplines and they'll have um, different experiences that they're going to share in addition to sharing their initiatives that they've developed over time that represent the different forms of environmental activism. Uh, we have a panel of um, five. Um, we have our own Sumirat who will be speaking. Uh, but before I can get there, I would want to go into the introductions. Uh, we have Rachel Butcher. Uh, Rachel Butcher is the ethical and environmental officer at the University of Birmingham Guild of Students. Unfortunately, we don't have her with us today due to unforeseeable events that came in and she sent her apologies. But nevertheless, she prepared a statement that will be read by one of us, that is Zoe, later on in, later on in the program. Um, I'll go straight to introduce uh, Laurie Duncan, who will be the first of the panel members that will be making their presentation. Uh, Laurie is a PhD student in the, in, in the energy systems and policy analysis and policy an analysis analysis research group investigating the role of local authorities in the transmission to net zero. He won Unilever's out he won Unilever's Our Planet, Our Future Competition, receiving 1000 pounds grant to launch a coffee cup return scheme at the university to eliminate single use cups. Laurie has also been a director of community energy at Birmingham for a year, helping to raise 30,000 pounds in grant funding for new projects, including a partnership with a big solar coop. Uh, Duncan will be sharing with us and his line of discussion will be pragmatic activism, channeling environmental concerns into actions. Like I earlier mentioned, we also have our own Sumirat, who's part of the organizing team of the event. He's a final year law student, and he's been inspired you know, to put forward his legal perspective on the COP26 and climate change, given that this conference or event brings about a wide range of disciplines that are going to put across um, different experiences that we're going to be learning from. So without um, further ado, I'll ask Rachel to come in first and um, make a statement, share the statement that uh, Rachel sent to us. And then thereafter, we'll have um, Sumrat coming in and then Laurie will come in at the end. And then thereafter, we'll put questions to them. Thank you. Zoe? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna be Rachel today. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't make it, but she's, as Kepa said, she sent a short statement for me to read. Um, and she says, a great deal of progress has already been made at the University of Birmingham in terms of sustainability over the past few years from decreasing the university's financial investment into fossil fuels to helping increase Birmingham's biodiversity, students are recognizing the importance of environmental well-being now more than ever. 
And while these leaps forward have been made, the university must continue to take action in fighting the climate crisis. As the ethical and environmental officer, I am working with the Guild of Students this year on a number of events, campaigns and initiatives to help make the university as environmentally friendly as possible. One of the key issues we are focusing on is improving transparency and communication between the university and students, as well as helping to establish a network between its campaigning groups. Climate change affects us all in different ways, so it is imperative that students have a way of presenting their individual ideas and concerns, thereby helping to create initiatives which enact change. We would like to make information regarding the university's environmental actions readily available and easily accessible to students. This is to encourage discussion and inspire further change, such as complete divestment from fossil fuels, um, a problem that many students are currently aware of. Um, uh, we would like to do a campaign this year to, to urge the university to instead invest into more sustainable technologies. This is crucial as according to the UN, Emissions must drop 7.6% per year from 2020 to 2030 to keep temperatures from exceeding 1.5 degrees and 2.7% per year to stay below 2 degrees. Our Autumn Sustainability Fair, which was held last week, invited student-led ethical and environmental groups to advertise their campaigning efforts to students. The event was designed to improve transparency, link several groups together and to invite conversation students could write down their concerns relating to COP26 and the environment at this event. This, their comments called for a number of things, including more transparency at the university, better recycling schemes, as well as access to more affordable and sustainable public transport. Going forward, I would like to implement schemes at the university that tackle these issues, as well as create a permanent system through which students can submit their environmental ideas, concerns and questions. I have also had discussions with other guild members about having a zero waste shop on campus, reducing the amount of single use plastic at the university and increasing the range of vegan food options. Additionally, we are keen to get the university to follow in others footsteps and declare a climate emergency. Amongst other things, this would place greater responsibility on the university to invest in and use renewable sources of energy as well as drastically reducing its carbon emissions. Students' concerns raised at the sustainability fair highlighted the importance of the university tackling climate change. Some students noted the increased effects of climate change in other countries, as well as the medical impacts on people's health around the globe. The quality of students' future health and well-being heavily depends on the actions that people and institutions take now. I'm looking forward to planning more events and campaigns this year and would like to thank Alex and the rest of the team for giving me this opportunity to share the Guild's plans and current actions. Thank you so much, Zoe. I will invite Sumerton to address the event. Thank you so much, Kappa. Now I'd like to begin. The world is changing rapidly and will continue to do so but it seems we are slowly and steadily forgetting how to be good guests, how to walk lightly on the earth as its other creatures do. Greetings, good afternoon once again, those who have recently joined us. My name is Sumirat, I am a final year law student in this prestigious university. It's worth to note that we are only 11 days away from the world's attention turning to Glasgow, where world leaders, advisors, and experts will finalize rules under the Paris Agreement and the Paris Agreement rule book to boost goals to combat climate change. Since uh, Naomi has already led a good foundation for our event and everyone will be like sharing different perspective from different disciples, due to which I'm quite motivated to express my legal perspective on the COP26 and the climate change. COP26 will be the first COP at which nations will submit their national commitments, outlining how they want to reduce their emissions, known as uh, National Determined Contributions or NDCs under the Paris Agreement, Current MDCs will not meet the Paris Agreement's temperature target, and the world is on the record for a third degree Celsius temperature increase by the end of the century. As a result, COP26 is regarded as crucial for increasing levels of ambition and actions. Some of you may be wondering if climate emergency is about fossil fuel emissions, what does law have to do with it? That's an interesting area because the transformational changes required for 
global decarbonization will be dependent on the legal frameworks at both international and state levels. International and domestic law must collaborate to achieve the goal set by the international community. A 2020 study helped me understand that the companies and ind individuals are becoming more environmentally concerned and are rethinking their entire approach to how they function. And COP26 may have a greater impact on this. There is no doubt that a global response to climate change has been unsatisfactory, but it has been better than nothing. There are hundreds of climate change regulations in countries all over the world, but how effective are they at solving the concerns? I was curious to see how effectively these laws were functioning. I discovered that each new law reduces annual carbon dioxide emissions by an average of 0.8% in the first three years and 1.8% in the long run. Some laws are more effective than others at re reducing emissions. It is also like vital to con consider how successfully a country can put a new law into effect. Some are uh, far better at enforcing laws, implying that they are more likely to reduce emissions. To overcome this global issue, we all must work together to create stronger policies. I'm sure majority of you are aware that the automobile industry is battling with the latest power shift from gasoline to power with brands like Tesla, Porsche, and Ford empowering a variety of strategies to encourage us to upgrade. These electric cars, in my opinion, require attention in terms of financing the adjustments required to meet the UK's promise to achieve carbon net zero by 2050. Let me explain why. I see the electric world as a chicken and egg situation in which investors are unsure whether to invest in infrastructure or in the production of electric vehicles because the return of one is dependent on the availability of the other. Interestingly, I like to inform all of you that it currently requires 40,000 vehicles per day to support a charging point for electric vehicles. Uh, should the government do something to close this gap? Well, I agree that the government should do something, but the difficulty is that there are so many areas that require funding, which complicates matter even more. Furthermore, I believe that there is a gap in what policymakers assume is required to achieve net zero emission by 2050 and the reality of what we will need to work on. Apart from that, Nate Rimac, who is preparing to take over the Bugatti brand and manufacture his own electric vehicles, claimed in one of his most recent interviews that he's aware of the environmental benefits of driving electric vehicles. He considers the production of electric automobiles to be a drop in the ocean. What I liked about his way of looking at the world was that if we truly want to make a difference in the environment, the easiest and the quickest solution with the largest impact is to quit eating meat instead of driving an electric vehicle. Many may suggest, and I agree, that we cannot host events in this new normal without men mentioning Brexit. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that United Kingdom has now left the European Union. Are you aware that the regulations governing uh, nature conservation, water quality, clean air, and other, body, uh, and other environmental safeguards that originated in Brussels are under threat. And we have lost the crucial EU bodies in charge of monitoring and enforcing these laws. The Environment Bill is intended to be the United Kingdom's new environmental framework. It is now being debated in Parliament and will be fully implemented by the end of 2021. The Prime Minister has admitted publicly that the Environment Bill will be the load star of this government, but based upon what we have seen thus far, it falls short. The bill as it is not ambiguous enough to safeguard our environment and people's health. If the UK is to enjoy world leading environmental protection, the government must make the environment bill a top priority. One of the most important legal battles for all of us as citizens or lawyers is the current fight to connect legal rights with the dangers posed by climate change. In essence, the debate is whether a secure and stable environmental is a fundamental human right. Is it the government responsibility to protect it if there is one? This has not traditionally been regarded as a fundamental right. It is not mentioned in the European Conventions on Human Rights, for example. There are undoubtedly valid reasons behind this. Historically, catastrophic disasters such as floods or earthquakes were viewed as acts of God rather than men or women, unless they were specifically traceable to the actions of one organization, individuals or group of individuals. However, we currently live in a period where many activities that were formally attributed to God are widely considered to be the result of the widespread human activity around the world, such as the extraction of fossil fuels. 
Is there a right to this for a UK citizen? Without such a right, governments and huge corporations, which are primarily blamed for global warming, cannot be held accountable. Many lawyers throughout the world are participating in a litigation to put man-made climate change within the scope of justifiable activities, typically for environmental NGOs such as clients. Or Many prominent legal firms now have climate change units, yet they frequently serve climate clients that many blame for issues in the first place. The LSE's Grantham Research Institution on Climate Change and the Environment keeps a running tally of climate change cases in the UK, which it estimates to be 56. There are more than 1,300 climate suits from 29 nations throughout the world, according to the statics. There are over 1,000 of them in the United States. Some countries have been more receptive to the argument for fundamental rights than others. Cases are frequently taken on behalf of children whose future that jeopardize comparable to the legal complaints filed by, let's say, Rita Thunderbolt and 16 other young activists from 12 countries with the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. Now I like to talk about a high profile case from the United Kingdom, notably Juliana versus United States, in which 21 young people sued the federal government for infringing their right to a safe environment. The verdict is a setback for climate activists and demonstrates the limits of the court's willingness to hold the government legally responsible for the effects produced by the greenhouse gases. The judges all agreed in this case that climate change is an urgent and a dangerous concern. But they concluded that the plaintiffs who were between the ages of eight and 19 when the claim was filed lacked standing to sue. They all stated that the climate policy must be implemented through the legislative branch. According to the verdict, the panel reluctantly ruled that the plaintiff's arguments must be addressed to the political branches or to the electorate at large. As governments have failed to deliver effective climate measures, courtrooms have emerged as a significant platform for pursuing an agenda to restrict emissions and Juliana case was one of the series of the climate change lawsuits making their way through various US courts. More than a dozen cities and counties have filed lawsuits against companies like Exxon for the climate related harms caused by their products. However, Juliana case stood out among climate lawsuits because it took on the federal government rather than the fossil fuel industries. If we don't want to, in the coming years, to be a reminder of what it likes to live in uncontrollable environment, we must now step outside of our comfort zones, use our imagination and engage acts that will collectively build the capacity within each of us to change our future. The 16th U, uh, UN Conference of Youth, or COI-16, will also be held in Glasgow ahead of the COP26, which I feel will inspire some of you to realize that youth voices are more important than ever in driving the climate change uh, conversations. I will also ask all of, you, all of the wonderful folks here today to look at the crypto protocol in 1997, whose goal was simply to reduce carbon emissions and the UK's commitments now net zero emission to realize that sometimes one has to go bigger. Greater Thunderbolt even accused the British government of being climate villains at the Youth for Climate Conference last week in Milan. As a personal remark, I believe that for the time being, the best we can do as law students or other students from diverse discipline is to challenging the status quo. Before I leave, I like to point out that if you follow all the rules, you might miss out on all the fun. So don't be afraid of getting things wrong. Thank you so much, Sumerat, for the presentation. I'll now call upon uh, Laurie to make his presentation and thereafter we'll, we'll put questions to them. So in the event you have any questions out there, kindly put them in the chat box and then we'll put them to our speakers later on after Laurie has made his presentation. Thank you. So yes, as was mentioned before, uh, I'm a PhD student in the well in chemical engineering, although it doesn't really fit with chemical engineering. It's it's very interdisciplinary and it's across energy and local government. And it but that's not what, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that I'm involved with uh, along the theme of pragmatic environmental and climate activism. Um, because I'm relatively new to this. So my undergraduate degree was in mathematics 
I'm, I'm now a second year PhD student. Um, and so I come from a background where absolutely everything is focused around problem solving. Uh, and you're always looking for solutions. So I've found it quite frustrating. Often climate problems can be presented as this sort of false dichotomy between very, very individual actions, um, you know, personal carbon footprints, going vegetarian, you know, getting a bamboo toothbrush, and global disasters. And they are they're sort of completely uh, separate and independent of each other. I um, want to be very clear, I'm not saying for a moment that uh, the, the small individual actions aren't important. I'm a vegetarian, I do anything individual that I can to be sustainable. Um, but there is, I'm sure that many of us have, have experienced it, you can sort of veer between being quite hopeful about uh, progress at things like COP26 and, and you know, improving climate change and mitigation and then you know the next day you see something in the news and a government somewhere has decided not to follow through on its promises and you know i'm always on the lookout for very pragmatic things where individuals can contribute to something in between this so not necessarily being able to prevent mass deforestation in brazil but also on a much larger carbon scale than just what you can achieve on your own. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about two different projects I'm working on. Firstly, the Community Energy. So I'm a director of Community Energy Birmingham. Um, it's a bit of a broad, uh, ill-defined term, Community Energy, but essentially it, it means that a group of volunteers, sometimes there are paid staff as well, but in our case, it's just volunteers working together uh, in some form of cooperative structure. Uh, and we we personally work on putting renewable generation on community building. Other places uh, have put wind turbines up, hydroelectric, uh, but then in increasingly these, these groups all across the country are beginning to diversify their efforts. And so some are doing electric vehicle charge, charge point infrastructure, um, retrofit. We're also starting to look at that as well. Um, and the, the, we've raised the money for this, for these community buildings with a community share offer. So that's where uh, instead of a typical way of raising investment, where you'd have a very small number of very large amounts of money, we have quite a lot of investors putting in a small amount and then they get they have a community share, uh, which which pays back a very small amount of interest. It's, it's pretty nominal, but that's not really the reason that our investors are putting money into this, it's because they want to, to put something to their local community. So pretty much all of our investors are from Birmingham, uh, you know, from the, the very local neighborhood where we are intending to install solar panels. And then the building will pay us uh, to use the solar electricity that we are generating with those panels. So we've, we've got a number of arrays. We've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, Acker's Adventure Center in East Birmingham. That's the picture there. We've got some on their, on their uh, sort of communal building. Uh, we have one on the football stadium in Castle Vale. And all of this was quite dependent on the government's feed-in tariff subsidy, where we would be paid by the government a fairly generous rate for generating electricity. And that's gone now. And so we continue to be paid for our existing installations, but anything new, we have to find some other business model for that. Uh, and we are working with another group that work nationally called the Big Solar Co-op. And they have a new model that doesn't rely on these subsidies, essentially clues in the name. It relies on buildings and quite large energy usage. Um, and it's, it's more of a professionalization of community energy um, in that we're not just targeting very small community buildings now in order to make the business model work. Yes, we want to do the, the buildings that we previously did, but we also want to be able to just get as much renewables out there as possible, you know, completely cover Birmingham's roofs in solar. And so we're looking at factories, we're looking at data centers, 
uh, all sorts of public buildings as well. Anywhere that we can get a really big chunky bit of renewable electricity generated in Birmingham. And the model relies instead of how we have previously done things where it has been a very small number of volunteers at the moment, six, and we do pretty much lots and lots of everything. Instead of that, uh, the big solar cop have a small number of staff and then lots and lots of volunteers all doing lots of little things. Uh, and so one, one good example is uh, designing arrays like the one in the picture. So that was designed, it's a free software called Open Solar, and you just need, you can learn it in an hour pretty easily. Uh, we run regular training sessions, and once you've done that, you can, if you, with a bit of practice, you can do a roof in 15 minutes, no problem. Um, and it's it's quite satisfying. It's It's really great because you're breaking down the volunteering workload. So if you have someone that can only do half an hour, an hour a week, that's fine. You can let them do that. You can give them the opportunity to do that. You're not giving them an, an enormous commitment, which can be quite a burden sometimes, and not everyone is able to take that on. So equally, you can do lots and lots of these, and there are other options as well. So for instance, we're now in the process of approaching sites with legal agreements uh, for the purchasing of the electricity, and we need people that will be able to, to read through these legal agreements and, and talk through uh, building owners as well and, and tell them exactly what, what they're getting into. Um, and so, you know, that's the perfect thing for a law student to do. If you want some experience, it's, it's a thing to do because they're reaching to a really big solar array in the end, but it's also fantastic to put on your CV. I've been trained in how to use open solar. I've read through several legal agreements that have come into place. And so that's one side of the things that I do. And then the other project, which was mentioned, is uh, this cup return scheme. So it's, it's almost entirely replication from my former university, uh, where a, a scheme was started uh, using these, they're called Coretto cups. It's, it's basically just a polypropylene cup. So that's the kind of plastic that is, is fully recyclable, even in Birmingham, where not much plastic gets recycled, but it is a very recyclable plastic. You get your hat um, and then you can take it out, no problem. And then once you're done with your cup, you then return that to either um, a cafe or a collection point. So we could have one in the library, we could have one in your head tower, wherever. Um, they are then collected back, taken to, to be cleaned, and they can go around this cycle again and again and again. Um, so in Warwick, they had the, these six collection points just to start with. And that brings a lifetime saving of about 96%. That is increasing as well as they um, they develop new, new, newer versions of this cup design um, where it uses less and less plastic um, because it's a sort of foam technology, which means that it, it's insulated as well. It's a bit disconcerting the first time you hold it, you think it should be really hot to touch and you need one of those silicone rings that you get uh, with, with a typical reusable cup. But no, it's a really clever bit of technology. Um, it also means that there's no extra cost to the cafes because they aren't having to buy paper cups anymore and they actually save a lot of money on this and so it's a very attractive proposal if you can demonstrate it to them if you can give them their initial batch of cups you can say just try running these for a few weeks a few months they'll very quickly see that they're saving a lot of money on not having to buy paper cups uh, and then once they've gone through this cycle, you know, they're, they're designed for about a thousand uses. They can do quite a few more than that, but once they've got to the end of that, they can be recycled. And even better, there are now companies that are um, making this even more of a circular economy by leasing out the plastic molecules that go into these cups. And so even if a cup breaks or, you know, it's worn out, you take that back to the person that has leased you these cups and they will then reform that into a new cup. So it's just completely closing the loop of plastic. Uh, and so it's a really, really great use of plastics uh, in an environmental, uh, ben environmentally beneficial way. Um, and so you know, they, they started with a little bit of seed funding and they, they got some cups and bin, they tried a uh, cafe and it was a really good return rate until the pandemic struck. 
and carried out by uh, all of the cups disappeared across the country to university owned cafes. Uh, and as was mentioned before, I, I entered a competition run by Unilever and I've, I've won a thousand pounds in order to start this kind of scheme at Birmingham. It's been a bit frustrating at times because it's very difficult to know exactly who to approach, where to, you know, who are the right people to talk to to get this kind of scheme implemented. We've had a change of sustainability manager, um, but finally we're making progress again. And uh, the idea is to start a trial uh, at the Cafe in the Vale uh, in, in the hub there. And we should hopefully be able to do that in January. Um, I, I was just talking to the, the catering manager there yesterday and he's very, very keen. So we should hopefully be ordering our first batch of cups soon. And again, this is a really great thing to be able to get involved with. It's very, very easy volunteering. So you can tell a student, you can offer the option for a student, can you just collect a crate of cups on your way from the Vale to your lecture or vice versa, or you know, take, take something, take a box from the library to a cleaning facility. It's really, really simple acts of volunteering. And so loads and loads of people are willing to do this. I did a survey last year and there almost 500 people responded. And loads of people were really, really enthusiastic about this sort of thing and would very, very happily. And it's that idea of light touch volunteering op opportunities that allow you to contribute to something bigger. You know, it, reusable, customer-owned reusables are great. And of course, we should not be discouraging that at all. And I'm not, this is intended to work alongside it. But, but the unfortunate fact is only one in three people will ever use a reusable cup. And that's for all sorts of different reasons. But in the best circumstances where you have a really big extra charge for using a paper cup, people are still gonna forget their reusable cups. People are still going to sometimes want another drink later on in the day and they won't be able to clean it. You know, it, it's a bit inconvenient having to carry a coffee cup around for some people if you're carrying all sorts of things, for instance. And so it's how do you get the other two thirds of people who aren't already doing that to use a more sustainable option. It's how do you make the default option sustainable? Um, and so this is one really good way of doing it. And we're finally making progress again. Uh, so just in, in summary, from a pragmatic point of view, I think it's really good to be able to offer people, and especially because you know, many students will be happy to protest, join something like Extinction Rebellion. Um, many won't, many will not be comfortable doing that sort of thing. They will still deeply care about the environment, but they have different limits of what they are willing to do um, to sort of enact their, their beliefs and their morals. And so it's nice to be able to offer opportunities for individuals to contribute to something bigger, but doing so flexibly, enabling more people to get involved in different ways, not the traditional, uh, not just restricting to the traditional camp. And again, I stress that I'm not in any way um, detracting from those. Of course, they are really important, but it, it's all about making these initiatives easy for people to do, making them the default option. We don't want to put people off if there are people that we can bring to our cause and we can make more people environmental activists. That's fantastic. We want them all. We've just got to find different roles for different kinds of people. Uh, and, and one way that I've found with that is if you can highlight co-benefits of green initiatives, you get a lot of a lot of extra take up. So I was at a site yesterday in, in East Birmingham. We were at a really massive factory for this solar scheme. And we were talking on the way back about the fact that they were only really interested in it because it was going to save their money because installing their own solar panels means that they are less uh, less at risk of fluctuating wholesale electricity prices. They have a much more reliable power source. And we were saying, that's fantastic. That's exactly the sort of people that we're after. People that are not necessarily going to put solar panel roofs without some other incentive. So if we can sort of find some incentive for them that makes them do the environmental thing, that's brilliant. They wouldn't have done that otherwise. All the people that are really enthusiastic about solar, they would have done it anyway. So it's it's about how, you know, how do you broaden the church of climate activism? And yeah, that, that's my talk. Um, happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you so much, Laurie. Very interesting presentation you have there.
And also I like the way you summed it up that each of us has a role to play in our different capacities. And uh, to that extent, I'll invite uh, Zoe and Alex. I know we have some questions in the chat box to put across questions to our presenters. Zoe, yeah. go first. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, that was a really good presentation. Thank you. I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, like Kefa said, I liked how you highlighted that not to take away from any of the other parts of the movement, but there is, it's a very rounded thing. There's lots of different things you can get involved in and lots of different angles from which to come at it from, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and also what you said about the dichotomy of big systemic change and also individual, it doesn't have to be either or, it can be somewhere in between. I think it should be. I think that's how it would be most effective. So um, yeah, um, what do you, so correct me if I'm wrong, is that has the Warwick um, Cup scheme, is that like in full effect now or is that still in a trial? You probably addressed this already. So, <laughs> so unsurprisingly, COVID has been oh, a yeah. really difficult challenge, both at Warwick and also starting it here. So initially we were we were talking about starting it in January 2021. Then the next lockdown came in uh, and it's just got delayed again and again and again and then th there have been some other technical problems as well um, but no at Warwick they had a bit of a quiet year partly because all of the people that had been involved or quite a quite a few of them either graduated or were international students and couldn't get back to the university um, but but now they've, they've moved out, out of their trial and they are uh, launching in a small number of university-owned cafes uh, and then hoping to expand um, the reason one of the reasons of it's been delayed is we could have started a little earlier, but then you really run the risk of it not being ready. And that's the worst possible thing you can do when you have when you have people that are somewhat on board, but require certain things to be ticked off the list before they agree to it in full. Because the worst thing you can do is do it half heartedly and then it can be dismissed as a failure. And any time that you want to try a similar thing in the future, they can point to it and say, well, we tried that and it didn't work. So it's 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 really important that you you have everything in place beforehand. You know, one of the important things is uh, making sure that the cafe staff are trained and understand exactly what the point of it is and why we should be promoting it and and why it's beneficial. That there are all sorts of schemes around the country that have been set up all using slightly different return methods. There's some you have to put a deposit down and then you get that back when you return your cup. Others, it's more like a library card loan. So you get fined if you don't bring it back, but it's no charge as long as you're using it correctly. And it, it's just all about that interaction with the barista in the coffee shop. Visibility there, you know, can, they, can people see that it's even an option? And do they understand it's an option because if they do, they're very likely to go with it. It's a really, it's a, it's one of those great win-wins. Um, it's the convenience of a disposable cup, but with the environmental credentials of a reusable. Yeah, definitely. And because of that, um, and also you mentioned the incentive to cafes, um, it making coffees and things cheaper for them. Do and I guess based on the small launch of the Warwick one in a few cafes, do do you think the response will be? everything that, I mean, we think it should be, because you mentioned you got good like survey responses, but I guess it comes down to what do we, do we think people will actually take it up, even though it seems like a no brainer to us, but. No, it's interesting because th yeah, people will always surprise you and there will always be hiccups. So in, in Shrewsbury, where one of the first schemes of this nature started, uh, they actually found that people really didn't like the idea of a reusable lid being shared with people. This was pre-pandemic. And it was just something about the people of Shrewsbury found it a, a little bit strange, sort of disgusting to be sharing lids with other people. Now, that's, you know, it's completely irrational because these are the same people that will happily use a knife and fork in a cafe or a restaurant. And it's the same, you know, it's the same thing that we're using that and it gets cleaned and then we use it again thousands and thousands of times. But some, for some reason, lids just people didn't get on with them. And so there they adapted their model so people can buy their own silicone lid that they then 
bring. And so it's it's sort of a hybrid between owning your own cup, but it's not a cup, it's just the lid. And then you use a deposit scheme for the cup. So it, you know it's a lot easier to carry around. You can stick it in your pockets. But at the University of Warwick, that was really not a problem at all. People didn't think twice about sharing a lid having been cleaned. Um, so there are all sorts of surprises that do come up along the way. Um, yeah, that, that's why you need a trial. Uh, that's why you, you don't just roll it out across the whole of campus because things will go wrong and it's good to identify them early in a, in a situation where you can make changes quickly. Can I just can I just pose another question? So I think, uh, first of all, there is a question in the chat about the agreement with Siemens. Um, my understanding is that there would be a, that the idea is to create a, a smart infrastructure at the university. But since we don't really know the answer to this question, I just wanted to say that we will refer this question to the guild and let the guild explore. So ju just that you know that we're not in a position to answer the question, but we will not leave it to this. We will, we will revert it to the guild. But I have uh, questions uh, both for Laurie and for Sumerat. So Laurie, you, you said, and one of the things I really liked about what you were saying is that in a way, when you are thinking about a, a commercial idea, you equally have to think about how that changes the social behavior because we don't really respond all in, a, in, a, in the same way. And I wonder, I guess my question would be how difficult it is to think about all the possible social implications, because as you said, there is this example in Shrewsbury where the lid could be an issue, but you have different you know, places where this will not be an issue. And I guess my second question would be how difficult it is to um, implement the business idea, because I know that probably there are IP issues involved, um, how you get investors on board to, to, to finance your project. So just if you can tell us more about that. Um, and then I have a question for Sumerat. It's more question. Do you think that we're now at this stage where we need to think about um, uh, equipping our students with climate change skills. So I'm a lawyer as you are, and I was thinking it would be really important to think about how we um, have the graduates who are uh, really robust climate change lawyers, because climate change is becoming quite important in all the legal disciplines. And equally, would that be applicable then to different disciplines outside law? So I will leave it first to Lori and, and, and then to Sumarash if, if, if they want to, um, uh, to give their views. Right. So yeah, the first question on the, the social considerations of these sorts of things. <laughs> I mean, surveys is one good place to start because you're, you're getting a bit of a snapshot. And I was, I was careful in my survey design to ensure that I wasn't just getting uh, the, you know, the usual suspects. So I wasn't just getting answers from the people that we have in this room, the members of Plastic Free UOB or you know, it's very, very easy to skew your answers if you do that. And actually, it, it was about 90% of the respondents weren't part of any kind of scheme, uh, any kind of society or, or activism um, coordinated at the university. They, they were just, you know, we had a number of staff members as well, staff, uh, a couple of local people, a few graduates. And so trying to eliminate any kind of confounders like that where obviously people involved in a sustainability society are going to be in favor of these things and they will give you very different suggestions. Um, they are almost certainly the people that are already using reusable cups, so they're not really the kinds of people that you want to hear from. Um, but also you know, some more technical things as well that you need to learn from cafe staff who have the experience with these sorts of things. You know, the university has an eco to go scheme, uh, which, which is where they, ha they have branded reusables and it was really interesting hearing about the lessons learned from that. So initially it didn't sell very well. Then they put the University of Birmingham logo on it and it sold incredibly well. They sold out within a term because people want to have the merchandise at their own university. It's the same as buying a hoodie branded at the University of Birmingham. People liked having that. And so we were talking quite seriously, well, do we actually want to have the logo on this cup? Because then will that make it more likely that people will take it home with them and not return it? Because they want to keep it in the, you know, they want to have one at home. So all of these difficult considerations, you just got to give them a go and then see what happens. Um, on the funding, I think, well, most of the stuff that I've done has been with uh, grant funding. So I've just gone out and looked for grant opportunities and that's worked quite well so far. With the solar though, um, it, it's really interesting. So 
we need to raise a lot more money for the solar panel arrays that we're now looking into compared to previous ones. They're, they're about 10 or 20 times bigger than any of our previous projects. Um, and one thing that we can do is offer people a sort of an instant green credential and a legitimate green credential, which a lot of investors are now looking for, uh, and businesses as well that, that are interested in putting these solar arrays up. It might be that they want it to be tailored exactly to their uh, their own ESG strategies or you know, that their own terms and conditions within their company, they have certain things to, that they have to, um, certain criteria they have to meet in order to satisfy their, their board or their shareholders or whatever. But it's being able to tailor your project to what they are looking for. Um, so it, it could be, you know, we, we've changed our solar supplier because we were having problems with um, you know, importing from China and a lot of modern day slavery being embedded in solar. Once there was a report of about six months, 12 months ago that came out uh, highlighting a lot of problems from the um, Xinjiang province. And so we've now got a European supply. Um, now that also means that it's, um, <laughs> it's much less of a supply chain problem, um, which is causing problems for everybody at the moment, but that's something that a lot of companies will be interested in being able to say that on their website when people look them up and they want to check their green credentials or well, we can we can cater for their needs basically and and a lot of people are interested in that sort of thing yeah thank you very much um Sumara, did you want to answer mm -hmm. the question yeah. Alex did ask uh, like interesting question. I would like to start by answering with uh, like a small quote from a country from uh, like a saint in which he mentioned that uh, air is our guru, water is our father and earth is our mother. They give us life. We sleep in their laps night and day. So we should not spoil them. Like earlier, like when I was like in my previous like legal experience, I didn't got much time to experience like how we could see environment from the perspective of law. But most recently I participated in a, like a global citizen program like where I was presented with 17 key global issues that needed to be addressed, like climate change being one of them. And most critically, each of them had the capacity to like accelerate impact and development. And I still remember a conversation that I had with a peer from this learning journey that was kind of like quite enthusiastic in terms of urban planning and predicted that urbanization like spreads across globe and, and cities would be more economic if like seen from the way like she was seen. And overall, I think uh, overall, like if I see from the perspective of life, feel that there is not much that we get like influence in our like uh, education system, like in, the, in on the bachelor's level, like in, on the master level, we can especially like get a uh, deep like understanding, like as CAFA has recently completed, like his module on climate change. But for the LLB students like me, it would be quite interesting if universities could add a specific module or could promote like uh, as the program that I did, which is like global citizen program which I believe could like motivate more young lawyers that how they could involve themselves from the beginning of their law journey. Because earlier I was of the opinion that uh, I need to have special skill set to make uh, influence in, in the environment, but now have learned that anybody at any age can make a significant difference uh, in the, like for the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sumaritan. Uh, thank you. Laurie and thank you Alex and Zoe. I will move into the other two speakers to our panel. Um, we'll have um, Fisola Kelly, a literature and climate activist. Fisola is a second year BA English student with a creative pathway in drama. As a researcher, she's interested in looking in texts through a decolonial feminist view. This has a heavy focus on intersectionality, that is to say class, gender, and the environment. So welcome, Fisola. And then we also have her theme that she'll be sharing with us is around literature and climate activism. 
Then we have Matthew Cochram. Uh, Matthew is a BA stroke BSc liberal arts and sciences student who has authored an essay titled Six Lessons Etymology Can Teach Us About Tackling Climate Change. And this essay came up as a, run, as a runner up in the university climate writing competition. Outside of university, Matt works as a poet, educator, and environmental activist. In 2018, he was a National Youth Poetry, Na National Youth Poetry Slam champion. And in 2021, he and his team represented the university at Unislam, coming second. He has, he has performed at protests in the Houses of Parliament and on BBC Radio. As an activist, Matt has led climate strikes, met with members of parliament at the EU, and has advised the UN on sustainable food systems. We welcome you both and uh, we'll invite Fisula to go first. And then thereafter, Matt will come in. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I just want to say I think it's really great that we have a lot of disciplines talking about climate change because I think um, an activist is inherently intersectional because they're always asking the question of how can we make life more livable and I think from whatever discipline you are you can be asking that question and that involves looking at how we can make our environment more livable for us. Um, I'm very conscious of time so I'm going to talk very briefly about two things how my essay, How Can Literature Tackle Climate Change, came about. And then I'm going to run through a few ideas that I talk about in the essay. So my proposal of literature as um, a solution or a way of tackling climate change came about with my frustration with the way that I engage with climate discourse. Um, when I came to university, it was the first time I actually read about climate activism, eco-criticism within um, an academic sense but before that my main engagements were through social media and articles and I just started to get quite frustrated at how reductive some of for example like Instagram infographics I would see would just have slogans like save the planet and that didn't really mean anything or use plus um paper straws to save the turtles I just felt like the conversations that were being had on social media were so reductive and they weren't giving us the space and time we needed to meditate on climate change and how we as individuals and us as a society can tackle it. So the way literature comes in is I think it kind of counters the quickness and the turnover, the really quick turnover we have on social media in terms of activism. So for example, for a couple of weeks, a specific topic may kind of be in vogue and people talk about it for a while and then suddenly we're on to the next topic. But I think with literature, both reading it and studying it, you're forced to take time to really think about the subject and what you read kind of becomes part of um, your reference points that you use in life. And I think being well-read and studying literature and having lots of reference points can help you look at certain social issues um, with, with more questions or it can help you birth ideas that can help you tackle it. So moving on to some of the things I talk about in my article, um, the first thing, the title is called How Can Literature Tackle Climate Change? And I was thinking a bit more about that title. And I think the first question is kind of what is literature? What is this thing that I propose can tackle climate change? And um, in typical English student fashion, I'm going to say literature is everything. It's novels you read. It's text messages. I think especially in the digital world, something that... Um, is also important to think about is how we have digital literatures, um, WhatsApp chain messages, we all know information spreads a lot through that as well, um, but also academic writing, um, novels. So that's just something I was thinking of as well when I, I chose that title. But um, in, the, in the article, I focus specifically on literature as meaning novels and literature meaning studying literature both um, in higher education institutions and in, in the lower schools as well. And I think one of the virtues of literature as a novel is that it finds a way to kind of carry ideas 
within a story that doesn't feel too preachy. And I think once you end a story, the the message and the understanding doesn't end when the book ends. It's something that you can constantly think about and it's always in your associative memory. So I think having people um get people from just regular people and people in school but also policy makers and scientists reading literature um, and not just specifically climate fiction but any kind of literature is a really good way at expanding people's minds and making sure that the ideas that are circulated aren't just coming from one discipline because we've tried for years to tackle climate change with just science alone and here we are we're having this discussion right now so that's kind of proof that we're not where we need to be and um Another thing about literature and reading is that it really does help generate empathy. And it's a way that we can engage with something that we often relegate to just being climate or the planet or the environment, something that for a lot of people who may live in cities, they may not actually be able to bring the issue of climate change close enough to them. A lot of the really scary facts about climate change are also um, said with things like it will happen in X amount of years time. And really the urgency is now, even if you can't see it. Um, and in terms of writers, again, um, Naomi mentioned this earlier, but using art as a way to see, to look at a future that we can't see, I'm paraphrasing, but I think that's something that writers do really well, and making sure that we nurture writers and that we have dissemination of novels within schools, in public libraries, and making sure that public libraries are actually open so people can access writing and ideas I think is another really important thing. Um, the, the other side of the word literature that I want to talk about is learning literature and I think um, one of the really important things about learning literature is learning about literary theory and just for anyone who's not familiar about it, literary theory is kind of a framework to make you look at a certain text for example in a certain way so you could look at a text in a Marxist way, in a feminist way etc. And I think that method of thinking can also be applied to thinking about climate change. I think sometimes when we talk about climate change, there are a lot of blind spots that we naturally have because you're only one person with one set of experiences. And that's why it's important to open the conversation to people within different disciplines. So um, in my essay, I talk about a case of an eight year old girl called Ella, who her um, she passed away and her cause of death was linked to pollution and I think that case would directly relate to something that Naomi also spoke about all earlier within the legal field about having a right to a healthy environment so being able to open up questions and look at the way that um, climate also has other questions we need to ask like how does it affect women how does it affect people of color how does it affect disabled people those are the similar frameworks we have in literary theory when you're asking questions, literary theory especially that focuses on identity, like decolonial um, theory and feminist theory. These are ways to look at climate change and ask more questions that we may miss because, as I said, we only are a certain person with a certain set of experiences. So um, learning literature and teaching people how to ask questions, because when you ask questions, you can then kind of figure out all the problems you have even though that's actually impossible, because I feel like climate change births so many different problems in so many different ways. But being willing to question and understanding that the question never ends is something that literature does. And I think it's quite typical of um, English students to have that kind of stereotype of overanalyzing. But I think that's something we need in a situation like this. We need to figure out who are the people that are suffering? Who are the people that we forget about when we talk about climate change? And I think that framework of thinking is really important. I did say I would speak briefly, and I hope I have, but thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Hesola. I will now call upon um, Matt. Make your presentation, please. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Matt. Um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about um, how English language can help us um, think about climate change. Um, and I'm in a really weird position to do that in because I'm not an English language student. I'm a liberal arts and sciences student. I've probably studied about one um, English language module in my time at this university. Um, but I, outside of university, I work as a, um, as a poet. I do a lot of environmental activism and a lot of it ties back to this really specific bit of English language, um, which is called etymology. I'm, I'm going to use the chat a little bit. I've not got a... Um, 
Uh, I've not got a PowerPoint, but I'm going to use the chat and just kind of put notes of things that I talk about. So um, etymology being where words come from, what, what is the origins of the words that we use? Um, and uh, like Fasola, I wrote uh, an essay about this and you can find uh, both of our essays um, in that publication that I've just put in the chat there as well. So George Orwell um, wrote this essay called Politics in the English Language. And in that essay, he spoke about these things called dying metaphors which are things like falling in love. When I say falling in love, then people don't really think of gravity. They don't think of things falling. Uh, but there's a metaphor in there. Um, there's a poem in there. Um, and we have this like throughout our languages. A, a lot of what our, of our idioms are. And etymology is kind of like not just dying language, but fossilized language. It, it's, it's the poetry in everyday language um, that, that we've been entirely forgotten about but you can drill down into these metaphors and, and you get this kind of spurt of energy that uh, that can engage your argument I'll give you an example of this uh, Greta Thunberg's Our House is on Fire um, it is an image that had a huge impact on me um, if, if I'm, I'm sure most of you will have will have seen the House is on Fire speech uh, that Greta Thunberg gave um, it inspired me to get into into activism when the school strike started. I snuck out of house, out of my house. I went to Manchester. I'd never been to a protest before. Uh, I showed up. I didn't know what to expect. First thing that happened, someone handed me a megaphone and they said, "Leading the march through Manchester." And I said, "Okay." Um, and me and my friends, we we did that. Um, and, and the reason why I think that that metaphor spoke to me so powerfully it's not something that I, I recognized at the time but when i got into etymology i realized that the word eco right the word eco um comes from the greek word oikos which means house we've got this intrinsic understanding in ourselves that that the world our our, our ecosystems our environment is our home and, and that we need to work to protect it um and that's part of the reason why i thought that was that metaphor was was so powerful um, so fossil metaphors, that's one way to think about etymology. Another way might be that etymology forces us to think about if we take if we take climate change to be not just a political problem, a scientific problem, but also a communications problem, that etymology tells us to pay really close attention to the stories that individual words tell. We trace the roots of language, we find the roots of problems, we find the roots of solutions. Um, and sometimes, for example, I wonder if we treat the natural world differently if we had a different vocabulary for it, right? Would the would the um, the soup fin shark be endangered if we it had a name that didn't tell everyone to kill it and turn its fins into soup? Uh, would the right whale be endangered if it wasn't called the right whale because it's the right kind of whale to to kill it and, and use for lots of different things? I think I think it would have a big difference. My evidence being the um, many of you may have eaten the the Chilean sea bass, which is now an endangered species, but wasn't back when it was called the Patagonian toothfish. They changed the names because it, they thought Patagonian toothfish isn't a very tasty name. Now it's endangered species. Um, uh, conversely, you, I, I feel like uh, words can remind us um, of, of, of the parts of nature that we need to be protecting. I, I think a lot about um, the fact that the word penguin um, used to refer to a completely different species. Right. There, there used to be penguins, a different bird called penguins throughout the entire northern hemisphere. And they only went extinct a couple of hundred years ago. They went around, extinct around the same time as the dodo. But everyone is everyone knows about the dodo. and No one knows about penguins. Why? Because penguins in the northern hemisphere, which are kind of related to puffins, look so similar to penguins in the southern hemisphere that we use the same word for both. And when we killed all the northern ones, we didn't have the vocabulary to remember them. So I, I feel like it's important that we know about how uh, we need a language for the things that we uh, that we're trying to protect so that we want to protect them. Um, so after I went to my first climate protest in Manchester, I began running these protests in my own house. And I was driven by the houses on fire metaphor, but I was also driven by something else that Greta Thunberg said in her speech, which is, I don't want you to hope, I want you to panic. Panic is the driving emotion of the climate movement. And I, I'd argue that the reason that this message has become so powerful is because this is another fossil metaphor. Uh, panic comes from the Greek word pan. Um, pan was, was a nature god um, who had this ability to create a sound that was so powerful that it would scare the enemies of nature back into hiding. You can imagine that uh, Greta Thunberg in her speech was trying to do pretty much the same thing. Um, so panic inspires action, but it's really difficult to sustain. I think it's important to, to remember that Pan is the only god in Greek mythology who dies. Um, after a few months of panic and protest, 
uh, in too long spent in a, in a house on fire, I began to burn out. Um, I was experiencing what psychologists are now calling eco-anxiety, which again comes from the word oikos and from the Latin angere. I, I, I was house choked. Um, so despite what Greta had said, I began to figure out that just as we need, uh, just as a sustainable world needs uh, solar and wind, perhaps we need both hope and panic um, in order to get to that sustainable world. Um, I, I, I'd love to speak more about um, how to find hope in a climate crisis. It's something that I'm really passionate about. I don't have time, but I've created a resource uh, that I've also just put in the in the chat uh, of, of podcasts and articles and things that have been helpful to me. If anyone's struggling with eco-anxiety or that kind of thing, then I really encourage uh, checking that kind of thing out or adding to it if you've got more to add. Um, but I'll just I'll just share one quote, um, which is from this guy, uh, George Monbiot. He's a, he's a writer for The Guardian, and he's written this. He's written that the environmental movement up till now has necessarily been reactive. We've had been, we have been clear about what we don't like. We also need to say what we would like. We would need to show where hope lies. Uh, Mobio wrote that in a book called Feral. Um, and, and I wanted to mention it because it's leading into some of the environmental activism that I'm doing today. Um, I come from a town that is falling into the river, um, exacerbated by flash flooding caused by climate change. Um, and, and I was reading, I was reading Feral. Um, and and Feral is a book about bringing uh, large wild animals that used to live in Britain, about bringing them back. And he's got this this one chapter on on beavers. And he's talking about how beavers reduce flash flooding. And in that book, he lists a number of places in the UK that are named after beavers. And one of them is Barbon. Barbon is the next town up from me on this river that is now experiencing flash flooding that is destroying my town. And it's named after the creature that could potentially save us. So as, as beavers begin to reintroduce into more and more places, um, that that is an example of where etymology offered me um, a vision, a pathway uh, of saving, of, sa of trying to help a community, uh, my community that I had never even thought of before. Um, I could talk a lot more about etymology and I, I do in my essay. Um, if anyone wants to check it out or chat to me about it, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Um, but I, what I really wanted to talk about just briefly at the end is how um, how ridiculous how that it is that I've built a kind of activist practice around something as as niche um, as etymology and it, and it is ridiculous or if it's not too cringy to say also I think radical um, and I use the word radical in its etymological sense um, of rooted uh, to think think of radish right the, the word radical means rooted um, and which links of course to grassroots movement which of course links to rhythmatic uh, organizational structures um, but the, the kind of the thing that I'd love for people to take away from this, if you do take away anything at all, is that if you root your environmentalism in your passion, whatever your passion is, whether it's etymology, whether it's poetry, whether it's carpentry or um, penguins or, um, or, or literally anything, um, then there will be a link. There will be a link to the problems that we're facing and it will bring you a perspective uh, that is radical, uh, that is unique um, and that is perhaps desperately needed. Um, I was going to end with a poem, but I don't think I've got time. Um, I'll just end perhaps with then just one more example of a, um, a fossil metaphor, which is that the word planet comes from the same place as the word plankton. They both come from a Greek word um, that uh, means wanderer. Um, and, and what a fantastic way that is to illustrate the fact that so much of our world's resources and, and the way that that world has been shaped has been, has been built on the tiniest, tiniest of creatures. Um, and that we also have the potential uh, to, to change the world as well. Uh, I'm going to stop speaking now, but thanks very much. Thank you much for your presentation and passionate and the passion you have toward etymology. We appreciate that. I'll open it up to Zoe and Alex to and Sumirat if you have any questions in the chat. That you'd want to. Yeah, so first of all, I want to congratulate Fizol and Mash for a great success in the in the prize competition. Uh, we really loved your essays and, and thank you very much for joining us today. So I, I have questions for both of you, that's okay. I think for Fizol, I think I really like your point about um, arts and humanities playing a really important role when it comes to climate change. And we often forget those disciplines are equally important and mass is making the same point we often forget that you know arts and humanities have a, have a role to play because by default we always think about natural sciences because you know they're 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 
you know, better equipped. But, uh, but I was wondering, Fizala, one thing that, that, that crosses my mind, and you're, you're speaking about the value of literature, um, and especially how this is really important, bearing in mind that, you know, we have a different discourse on social media. But I just wonder, what is your view? Because one thing I guess that I'm not seeing is that um, when we think about, you said that literature really should be in schools, we should play, uh, pay more attention to, to um, showing you know literature um in schools and so on and so forth but i wonder if you think about the practice currently let's say in primary and high schools you really rarely have an instance where the literature is used to educate small children or even you know teenagers about climate change and i just wonder do you think that we are at the point where we need to change the practice um, how we use literature in primary and secondary school, you know, as, as a kind of start of, of, of educating kids quite early that there is something like climate change. And I guess my question to Matt would be, um, if you don't mind, Matt, one thing that you, you, you really uh, articulated quite well is that um, the words we use are really important and you use two things that, 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 that are quite, I think, important. You use the word panic, but then you said that that panic needs to be balanced with hope. And I wonder if you, if you look at the kind of political discourse, I often find it's quite confusing. So we don't even know whether we need to panic or we need to hope. And, and not everyone, you know, if, if you think about an average person, they might not know as much as we you know about climate change on this call and how we kind of reconcile hope with, with, with I guess, panic and get a message which is meaningful um, for citizens and then you know, create that environmental activism that we want to see. But I'll leave it to Fizol and then to you to answer. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I'm going to say in terms of teaching literature and climate activism in the lower years, I think it's more about taking the subject a bit more seriously and being a bit more productive with the time we have. Um, so, for example, in things like guided reading, that's an amazing chance to really springboard from a book that could be talking about climate change and really having a deep conversation about what climate change means and meeting people at their level of understanding. And I think that's why it was really important for me to have social media and academic texts in the same discussion because not everybody engages with a 30 page academic article. That's just the fact of the matter. But understanding where people are and why people are at that level and why those specific texts or posts on social media mean something to them, that's a really good place to start. So I think, um, talking a bit more about the things people are reading and having really meaningful conversations is a great way to talk about climate change and literature within primary schools in the lower years. And I think that's the same goes for subjects again like creative writing, empowering people to know that writing about climate, whether you're a poet, you're a playwright, you're a novelist, writing about climate is a valid, important um, topic to have in um, fiction. So um, yeah, those are the two things I would say. Yeah, and I'll, um, where, where do I start? It's such a great question. Um, so I'll start maybe with a couple of definitions, or at least how I think about these things. Um, I think of um, hope as different from optimism. It was optimism is it's going to be all right. Same as um, pessimism is um, it's going to well, optimism is it's going to be all right no matter what I do. Pessimism it's not going to be all right no matter what i do hope is it will be it can be all right if i do something panic is i better do something or it's not going to be all right so panic and hope are actually not that different the, the core of both of them is agency but it's about whether that agency is driven by the carrot or the stick it's about whether it's um and and, and the message can be strengthened if it manages to engage with both simultaneously with by offering something people something to strive towards and something to strive away from and if you look at uh campaigns like uh donald trump's make uh, make america great again or the brexit campaigns take back control these are these are campaigns that in their marketing in their in their communication um are managing to to create utopias and dystopias within uh within their slogans um and and one of my concerns with the climate movement is that it is always focused on dystopia um it's always focused on what is the world that we're trying to get away from uh, or trying to avoid um 
and and and, and there's not something to balance it out which can be can be very exhausting if you don't feel like you're fighting for something you're just fighting to get away from something um i'm gonna lose my train of thought but yeah i, I suppose I, I, I there's almost like a level of shame right, right about people in in client in the climate community who are who who believe that we're not all doomed I don't know if other people have come across that, but I, I, sometimes when I when I speak about hope, people are like, "All oh, right, he's a bit unrealistic," and they don't fully understand what I mean by that, um, because it, because it it's about how do we have hope without negating the seriousness of the situation. Um, I, I but but it's very possible. It's a kind of communication that happens in almost every other form um, of, of politics. Um, but but that kind of carrot and stick approach hasn't been engaged with, I think, as much in in the climate movement. If that answers any of your question, or if that was just a ramp, I'm not sure. Thank you. Okay, so I well understand that you are time bound. You have to like go, but like I'm quite curious. For I have one question. Like uh, there is great mis great misunderstanding about the role of arts and humanities in climate change efforts. Like we always by default think of natural sciences, but your like talk demonstrates this is not the case. And literature has an important place. So what would you advise your peers about the best possible ways to like, demonstrate the importance of arts and humanities in figuring the climate change? Sorry, my internet's a bit lucky, but I think I heard that question. Um, I think I would say, first of all, um, it starts with advocating for the arts, um, making sure that people have access to it, making sure that all different kinds of people are making art. And again, that's focusing <clears throat> again on intersectionality, making sure that we're hearing stories from the global south, we're hearing stories from women, we're hearing stories from disabled people because um, climate change doesn't just affect people in the West. And I feel like um, this even shows with the type of people who are having, the type of world leaders who are having the, the main discussions on climate change. Um, and I think it's experimenting and creating because um, climate doesn't feel like a, I, I feel like for some people it doesn't feel like a worthy subject um, to, to write about or to talk about at length. And I think this even shows when um, you do literary analysis and you focus on language, and you focus on character, but even something like setting is like an afterthought. So it's really centering the idea of climate change and writing about the environment and um, making sure that people endorse writing about the environment. So I think the more dissemination and creation we have of climate fiction, of work about the environment, I think the better. And I think that's one of the best ways to champion the arts as a solution for climate change. Thank you so much, Misola, for your response. And now I'm quite curious for one question that I want, would like to hear from Matt. Like, is there any particular language in the climate movement that do you think like hinders its effectiveness? And it, was that anyone in the class? Yeah, is there any particular language in the climate movement that you think hinders its effectiveness? The movement that's hindering the movement. Yeah. Mm, yes, uh, but it depends on the people, right? I, I think I think as someone said earlier, I think that there's. Um, that there, there are everyone has a role that they can fill within the climate movement, um, but when there are some voices that kind of dominate how we see the climate movement, that um, that just because of their their loudness um, may may exclude others. I'm, I'm not going to name names because I feel I feel like we're kind of getting a feel of what I'm talking about. Um, but and that's not to say that those those voices are, are bad, um, but just that I think we need to make. I think there needs to be, um, like, like Priscilla said, actually, that there needs to be more uh, plurality um, in in in, the vo in voices, uh, so that we can we can recognise that we all have we have a place in this. But I, I think I think I think that's kind of the first thing that comes into my head with that question. Thank you so much, Matt, for your response. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think we have time for one more and then we will close the event. Um, we've got a question in the chat um, from Dion, I hope I said that right, which says, 
My question is directed to Fasola, but I'd be interested to hear Matt's views too. I find it difficult sometimes as an academic working in the area of environmental humanities, eco-criticism, to see how academic discourse translates into environmental practices or act activism. Do you think our methodologies and academic practice needs to change so that it becomes more inclusive, participatory or engaged with the wider public beyond academic institutions? <laughs> Don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> uh, I could. Um, oh, go on, go. You, go. Uh, you know what? Go first. Okay. Um, so I, I'd say yes, it does. Um, but I'd say only um, to the extent that other bits of academia and literature also need to be. Um, I know that I, as a person that fell in love with literature quite late on, there was a lot of my life where I felt excluded uh, by the kind of text that we were looking at. Um, by the area, eras, by the topics, by, by the people. Um, I, and um, I, I think that, I don't think that this problem is limited to eco-criticism eco um, or limited perhaps to literature as a topic. I think a lot of academia could do a lot more work um, in being inclusive um, uh, because uh, unless something is inclusive, when it, when it comes to an issue like this, which is about um, communicating to a whole globe of people, uh, it's not effective. Um, so uh, that probably doesn't give as many starting points as might be helpful. Um, but yes, I, I agree, I suppose. I sympathize. Um, I needed the extra thinking time for this one, but um, I agree with Matt, but I am also gonna say, I think there is value in the way that academics go about looking at climate change and climate activism and their particular methodologies. So I think it's not, it may not be as much of changing, but I think bridging the gap and showing the different levels, um, or not necessarily levels, I think that implies hierarchy, but the different ways different people look at climate change and uh, having a bit more explanation for why they do it that particular way. Um, that's not even really an answer, but that's my thought at the moment. I think kind of making sure there's a bit more connection between the way someone may understand it at a kind of elementary level and the way an academic may view it. If there's more of a conversation between all those people and their understandings, I think that's better. I hope that answers the question in, in some sort of way. Alex, you're on mute. <laughs> Are you able to unmute yourself or no? All right. Okay. Um, All right. Well, Thank you so much. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> Thank you so much, our panelists or speakers. Uh, Lori, uh, Isola, Matthew, and of course, Rachel in absentia. I mean, we've, we've, you've, you've, you've blessed us with a lot of uh, perspectives and experiences, which I believe that we've all taken up. In one way or another, I believe that the main theme was that we all have a part to play, and it's uh, a matter of finding out that passion and where that passion, uh, rather, it, it all comes about interpreting the passion and how it relates to the environment, and then going out to see you can play your part. Uh, right now, I'll, ask, I'll call upon Alex to come up with the whining remarks, given that we're left with one minute to the end of the event. Thank you. I don't think she's able to because of technical. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm, I have the worst connection today and it's just, it, you know, it's so unfortunate it's today. But anyway, I just want to thank the participants. I want to thank the speakers. Uh, I think we had a great session. And I also want to thank Kefa, Sumaras and Zoe for organizing this event, liaising with speakers and really having fantastic questions for the speakers. And I think this was an opportunity for us and what we wanted to aim with this and gain from this uh, experience is to celebrate the success of students at the University of Birmingham. And we have seen that, you know, there are different things that our students do, um, and all of those things fall within the environmental activism. So, you know, we have business ideas, we have student writing essays, uh, students 
being part of the movement or um, students being actively engaged in legal proceedings. So I think this is really something to celebrate that we have. I think the other thing that we wanted to hear from you is also how it's best to get engaged and also what academics should do to get students engaged. So I want to thank everyone, all the speakers and, and, and all the participants for questions that we had.